Hi folks, hope you're okay today. It's good to be with you. And we're looking at Clement of Alexandria and Tertullian, and we're looking at the book uh, by R. W. Dale, The Living Christ and the Four Gospels. It's a very old book, over a hundred years old, 1890. And um, we're going to read the chapter. And as I'm reading the chapter, uh, we're going to talk about um, the scholarship uh, concerning the, these two early church fathers. I've done videos on these guys before, but this will be a bit more in depth with we reading uh, R. W. Dale. He goes that at the close of the second century, all Christian churches received our four gospels as the authoritative records of the early church life. A ministry of our Lord is not contested by any school of criticism, nor is it contested that at the time these four gospels were universally attributed to Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. To ourselves, this is a fact of immense importance. For when we look back to the early days of the Christian faith, to the times when men were still living who had been heard and the writers of our sacred books had received the Christian gospel from their teaching and had known them as their personal friends, had talked with them in private about the miracles of Christ, his discourse, his sufferings and his resurrection. The distance seems immense. The imagination is oppressed by the intervening centuries. How can we make our way through all the confused fusions and uncertainties of this vast tract of time? But of these 1800 years, we can pass over 1700 at a single stride. We have in our hands the writing of Irenaeus, of Leoines, of Tertullian, of Carthage, of Clement and Origen, of Alexandria, and they attribute the four gospels to the same authors to whom we attribute them. They regard them with the same reverence. Is it possible to believe that this general consent rested on no solid foundation? Let the question be put in another form, a form suggested by the latest account that has been given of these sacred books by those who deny that they are genuine. At the close of the second century, these four narratives had secured in all Christian churches a place as great, as authoritative, as sacred as that which they hold now. Is it possible to, possible to believe that they could have won this universal recognition if they had been written by unknown men in unknown places at unknown times during the first half of that same century. And after all the apostles and all who belonged to the first generation of Christians were dead, there are two considerations which make it infinitely improbable. The wide area over which in every early times Christian churches were planted and two, the mutual independence of each other. Number one, within 30 years after the death of our Lord Jesus, there were churches in Jerusalem, in Caesarea, in the Syrian of Antioch and in Rome. There were churches in the heart of Asia Minor and in the great cities on the coast. There were churches in Philippi, Thessalonica and Corinth. Our materials for constructing the history of the diffusion of the Christian faith during the next 40 years are inconsiderable. But early in the second century we find that there were large numbers of Christians in the north of Asia Minor. Plenty have been sent into the province by Trajan and he wrote to the emperor to learn how he is to treat those who were guilty of believing in this strange superstition. The crime had continued to spread even while the persecution was going on. If he is still to punish those who persisted in it, he tells the emperor that a great number of persons are in danger of suffering. For many of all ages and every rank of both sexes likewise are accused and will be accused. Nor has the contagion of this superstition sea cities only, but the lesser towns also and the open country. Pliny thinks that by a wise policy it may be restrained and corrected. Quote, it is certain, he says, that the temples which were almost forgotten began to be more frequently. And the sacred solemnities, after a long intermission, are revived. Victims likewise everywhere brought up, whereas for some time there were few purchasers. End of quote. He thinks that many, quote, might be reclaimed if pardon were granted to those who shall repent. End of quote. That letter was written before AD 15. Fifty years later, the Christian gospel had spread so widely that Justin, in his dialogue with Trifo, says, There exist not people 
there exists not a people, whether Greek or barbarian or any other race of men, by whatsoever appellation they may be distinguished, whether they dwell under tents or wander about in covered wagons, among whom prayers are not offered in the name of the crucified Jesus to the Father and Creator of all things. End of quote. Gibbon. Gibbon. Sorry about this. Gibbon, who quotes the passage, has no doubt a right to call it a splendid exaggeration, which even at present it would be extremely difficult to reconcile with the real state of mankind. But Justin would hardly have ventured on so glowing a statement if it had not been notorious that the new faith had won great triumphs in many remote parts of the world. Indeed, we know from other sources that before the middle of the second century, there were Christian churches nearly in all the provinces of the empire. Now, th that's uh, our, our Dale there, R. W. Dale. And I've made some videos about this myself. Uh, it's a very important argument to make that Christianity spread rapidly in the first 100 years all over the Roman Empire. And the fact that the Gospels in the four corners of the empire were seen as authoritative shows you that it could not have been arbitrary in in that um in the sense of these books having that authority what that means is because there was such a widespread recognition of these four gospels early on in four, the four corners of the empire um it gives little credence to the idea that there were many other gospels and uh, the four Gospels were just chosen out of the many Gospels. Right early on, we see the four Gospels as authoritative. We go on. Dale says these churches were not under any central authority. The Apostle Paul, during his lifetime, maintained a vigilant su supervision over the churches which he had founded in Asia and in Europe, but he died more than 30 years before the end of the first century. John must have exerted an immense influence over the churches of Asia Minor, but he died about the beginning of the second century. The age of general councils had not come, as yet the bishops of Rome was not the ruler of Western Christendom. The churches stood apart and they had friendly relations with each other, but they were not bound together in one great ecclesiastical organization. No theologian in the second century rose to accept the ascendancy which belonged to Augustine in the fifth, Ancient churches founded by apostles were regarded with reverence. The Roman church had the additional influence derived from its position in the imperial city. But neither Antioch nor Rome had authority over the rest of Christendom. The churches followed their own traditions. If they modified them, it was in fraternal difference to churches, which they believed had been more faithful to the apostolic rule, not in forced submission to any excellent authority. Towards the end of the second century, there was a sharp controversy between the East and the West on the observance of Easter. How then are we to explain the fact that many years before 200 AD, all these churches, churches composed of men of different races, churches separated from each other by mountains and seas, churches in Rome and churches in Asia Minor, churches in Gaul and churches in North Africa, received the four gospels as sacred scripture and believed that they were written by Mark, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. I repeat that no great theologian whose fame extended from east to the west drew these remote and independent societies into agreement. Defensive judgment was not suppressed, consent was not compiled by the canon of the council or by authority of a pope. How came the churches to agree? There can, I think, be only one answer to this question. The Gospels must have been written and received before the first generation of Christians had wholly passed away. Had any of them appeared for the first time at last, at a later date, 
ancient churches which had been founded by apostles would have refused to acknowledge them. If here and there a church had been deceived, churches elsewhere would have protested against the fraud. The universal reception of the Gospels before 200 AD is a proof that they could not have been written by unknown authors between 100 AD and 150 AD. From the argument resting on the general consent of the churches at this close of the second century, I pass to the consideration of the value of the special evidence which is given by two eminent men of that age, Clement of Alexandria and Tertullian of Carthage. The two men in their intellectual and religious life were extremely unlike and they represent Christian communities having very different characteristics and very different traditions. The city of Alexandria had long been famous for its immense library, the literary glory of the ancient world and for its museum, or as we should say its university, in which crowds of students from distant countries listen to illustrious professors whose names have not yet perished. The general population consisted of men of all races and the Alexandrian school were, hosp school were hospitable to the learning and speculation of all lands. It was there that the bold attempt was made to blend and to fuse Greek and Oriental thought and to discover in the books of Moses the last and highest results of philosophy of paganism. Literature, grammar, criticism, mathematics, astronomy, medicine, whatever a man cared to study, he could study under great masters and in company with enthusiastic comrades. As early as the beginning of the second century, the number of Christians in the city was very large, among them Basilds and Valentius, and other teachers of Gnosticism, found some of their earliest adherents. The Christian church caught the Alexandrian spirit. Towards the end of the century, the great Christian school of Alexandria, the Catechal school, became the centre of the intellectual assault of the church on the thought of the pagan world. The school was open from morning to night without charge to men and women alike, where the intellectual life of the world was keenest and most intense. Most adventurous Christian scholars determined with intrepid confidence to demonstrate the transcendent glory of the wisdom revealed to the world in Christ. Nor were their resources equal to their task. Over this school, Clement presided for about 30 years from AD 190 to 203. It is probable, though not certain, that he was educated in Athens, which still preserved in the second century some tradition of its ancient intellectual supremacy. And there are expressions of his from expressions of his from which it has been inferred that in his early life he was a heathen. The nobler forms of heathen thought had a strong attraction for him, but it was by no sudden movement that he reached perfect rest in the Christian faith. For Clement, even when he had become master of the great Christian school of Alexandria, Plato sometimes speaks as if divinely inspired, and he believed that as God is the author of all good things, God had given philosophy to the Greeks as he had given the law to the Jews, as a discipline of righteousness, as a schoolmaster master to bring them to Christ. Perhaps, too, it was possible the gift came direct from the Father of, the Father of all and by the immediate illumination of the Holy Spirit. Or, if the philosopher had derived their best knowledge from Hebrew prophets, they were but like Prometheus, who stole fire from the heaven for the service of men. The light and fire were from God by whatever, whatsoever means they were obtained. He was clearly a man of wide and active intelligence. His sympathies were generous and we are separated from him by 1700 years. But he often thinks the thoughts which we are inclined to regard as the best results of modern life and speculation. He was a man of large learning and he was an eminent teacher in learned church. He lived in a learned city that such a man living and teaching within a hundred years after the death of the last of the apostles received four gospels as authentic and genuine, that he never suspected that they had been written long after the writers to whom they attributed were dead, is in itself a strong reason for believing that, at the close of the second century, the tradition which supported their genuineness and authenticity was ancient, universal and decisive. To give a list of the quotations from the four Gospels which occur in Clement's writings, in order to prove that he acknowledges their authority is wholly unnecessary, as unnecessary as it, as it would be to offer similar proof that their authority is acknowledged by Mr. Spurgeon or Canon Linnell. But it may well 
may be well to show that he did not accept the authority either of the Gospels or of other can can canonical scriptures without inquiring. In the lost work of his hypo hypotyposis, he collected the results, results of his investigation. Some passages have been preserved in this work, says Eusebius, Clement gives the tradition respecting the order of the Gospels as derived from the oldest or original presbyters. Quote, he says, he says, those that which contain the genealogies were written first, but that the Gospel of Mark was occasioned in the following manner. When Peter had proclaimed the word publicly at Rome and declared the Gospel under the influence of the Spirit, as there was a great number present, they requested Mark, who had followed him from afar, and remembered well what he had said, to reduce these things to writing, and that after composing the gospel, he gave it to those who requested it of him, which went then, which, when Peter understood, he directly neither hindered nor encouraged it. But John, last of all, perceiving that what had reference to the body of the gospel of our Saviour, that is, to the earthly and human side of our Lord's life and work, was sufficiently detailed and being encouraged by his familiar friends and urged by the spirit he wrote a spiritual gospel he disputes the authenticity of saying attributed to our lord because though it is contained in the gospel according to the egyptians and apocryphal gospel it is not to be found in any of the four gospels which has been handed over to us end of quote there is another point to be considered in connection with the testimony of Clement. He tells us he wrote his stromata as memoranda for his old age, that he might not forget the vigorous and animated discourses which he had heard in early manhood from the blessed and truly remarkable men, who had preserved the tradition of the faith derived directly from the holy apostle Peter, James, John and Paul. It was God's will, he says, that the truth should be transmitted from its original teachers as from father to son, though few of the sons were equal to their fathers. He had met the men from whom he had received the tradition in Greece, in Italy, and in the East. One was from Egypt, another was a Christian Jew, who he found in Palestine, another was born in Assyria, another of the greatest of them all, probably Pantenius, he found in Egypt. And it was when he found the last that his mind and heart reached their final rest in Christ. Through channels so various that the beliefs of an earlier generation had reached him. It is hard to imagine that men who respected countries so remote, represented countries so remote, and the lines of tradition which for two or three generations had been independent of each other, could have agreed to treat the Gospels as having been written by the authors whose names they bear. In these names had been attributed to forgeries produced long after the Apostles and all the contemporaries uh, passed away i'm just going to go and get a, a drink of water so i'll just have a break for one minute just give me a minute just get a drink of water
we're here now and uh, just got an orange and uh, just peeling the orange <clears throat> I really like these kind of studies um, fascinated with the early church fathers and uh, <coughs> really enjoy studying them and looking at their writings and looking at what they say so So without further ado, let's get on with the, the book. Page 128. From Alexandria, we pass to another great African city, the city of Carthage. After its restoration under Caesar and Augustus rose with it, rose with extraordinary rapidity to the great wealth and splendor. It was inhabited by a mixed population composed partly of the descendants of the ancient Phoenician settlers who in earlier times had raised their public republic to a greatness which disputed the power of Rome, partly of Roman colonists, partly of strangers from many lands drawn to the city by its immense commercial prosperity. The external forms of its civilization were derived from Rome. It became famous for its school of rhetoric and of Roman law, but in the religious faith of the people were deep traces of the Phoenician origin of the ancient Carthage, and their temper was as fierce as the heat of the African desert. The Carthini Carth Carth Carthinian church shared the intellectual and moral characteristics of the city. Intellectually, it was Roman, not oriental, practical, not speculative. Its temper was rigid and intolerant. It was capable of the most violent and passionate enthusiasm, and in the person of its sterner sons, capable too of an heroic fidelity to Christ under prolonged and cruel suffering. But when times of persecution came, many of its fanatical members proved inferior in constancy and fortitude to Christian men in their churches, who were less ostentatious in their professions of devotion to the faith and less intolerant in the denunciations of heathenism. Of the strength and limitations of this great church, Tertullian is the most illustrious representative. He was born in Carthage between 150 and 160 AD. He belonged to a good family and received an excellent education. Philosophy, history, rhetoric and law were the subjects which had the strongest attraction for him. His parents were heathen and he was more than 30 years of age, perhaps 40 when he received the Christian gospel. He soon gave proof of the vehemence of his zeal and the energy and fertility of his intellect, 15 or 16 of his boots, some of them apologetic, others controversial, others moral and ascetic, were written within seven years after his conversation. Even these early writings were marked by great moral austerity. According to Tolitolian, it was a crime for a Christian man to give any sanction, direct or indirect, to idolatry for idolatry is the supreme sin and includes all others. It is a murder, adultery and blasphemy. It was therefore a crime to witness the performances in the theater and the circuses for all public amusements were associated with honors paid to the gods. It was a crime to have friendly relations with people who were in the habit of witnessing these performances. To share in the observance of the holy days of the heathen was also a crime. As some of these days it was a national custom to pay debts and others to give presents. Tertullian contended that a Christian man should carefully avoid conforming to the customs, let him pay his debts and give his presents on days which were not devoted to the gods. To manufacture idols or to sell them was, of course, a crime. Excuse me. <clears throat> to traffic in, in, in any articles used in heathen worship was a crime. Magistrates had to discharge certain functions in relation to heathen temples 
and Christian men could not therefore be a magistrate. Schoolmasters had to teach their scholars the heathen mythology and to take part in school festivals which were held in honour of the gods. The very first payment of every people they consecrated the honour of Minerva. To be a schoolmaster was therefore not consistent with loyalty to Christ. It is apparent from the tone and temper of Tertullian denunciations that there were large numbers of baptised persons in Carthage who listened to this stern teaching either with indifference or with resentment. When he reached middle life he turned in despair from what he regarded as the hopeless corruption of the Catholic Church, the luxury, covetousness, cowardice, worldliness of both its clergy and laity, and trusted that he found among the Montanists the lost ideal of the perfect life. For this time his moral teaching became still more austere. The Christians in Carthage were menaced with persecution. What is lawful to escape persecution by flight? Was it lawful to escape persecution by flight? Tertullian, who believed that the voice of the Spirit was heard through the prophets of Montanism, the answer was clear, for the prophets incited men to offer themselves for martyrdom. Why, they asked, should you be ashamed of gaining glory? The opportunity is offered you when you are in peril of suffering for the name of Christ. <coughs> he who is not exposed to dishonour before men will be exposed to dishonour before the Lord. Seek not to die in your bed from disease, but to die the martyr's death that he may be glorified who suffered for you. The soul of Tertullian vibrated to that iron, iron string. More glorious, he exclaims, is the soldier pierced with the javelin in battle than he who has a safe skin as a fugitive." End of quote. To purchase safety, safety with money was as shameful as to flee. And the Christian man had been ransomed by Christ from the spirits of wickedness, from the darkness of this life, from eternal punishment, from eternal death, but you bargain for him with an informer or a soldier or some paltry thief of a ruler under, as they say, the folds of the tunic. Coming to, uh, near to the end now, and then I'm going to just talk about what I've read. If he were stolen goods, says Tertullian, which Christ purchased in the face of the whole world, yes, and yet uh, and set at liberty. No doubt Christ had said to the apostles that when they were persecuted in one city, they were to flee to another, but they were to flee not to ensure their own safety, but because the work they had to do was urgent at the time was short, yet shall not have gone through the cities of Israel to the Son of Man be become. End of quote. The same austerity and sternness that he showed in, the, in his discussion of Christian ethics and in his denunciation of clergy and laity, who live by a less severe rule than his own, appear in his treatment of heathenism. He hates it, scorns it, assaults it with incessant sarcasm and invective. In his apology, which is one of his earliest writings, there are many characteristic passages. The heathens, he say, falsely charge the Christians with shameful crimes. I will show you, retorts Tertullian, that practices upon a seek or that practices open or secret prevail among yourselves, which perhaps have rendered it possible for you to believe that similar enormities are committed by us. You attribute to, to your gods the most horrible offences, and those who worship them to do the same things. He recites with a fierce fidelity the deeds of cruelty and of lust, which he declares were common in heathen nations, and he adds with bitter irony that human goodness was an insult to the divinities. Deify your vilest criminal, criminals if you wish to please your gods. Clement of Alexandria was eager to find in heathen thought anticipations of the Christian gospel, and he looked into the abyss of heathen darkness with the hope of discovering some rays, however faint, of the light which lighteth every man. Tertullian poured upon heathenism a fiery stream of insult and hatred. The contrast between the two men is complete. In their temperament and in their methods of thought, they were as far as from each other as the east is from the west, but they were agreed in their reverence for four gospels. On what ground Tertullian rested his belief in their authority shown in the following passage taken from his treatise against Martian. Quote, against Martian, Westcott's translation, chapter 4, verse, uh, verse 5, uh, in uh, Westcott's translation, page 345, 346. Uh, Tertullian, this is Tertullian, quote, 
if I acknowledge, <clears throat> excuse me, if I acknowledge that this is more true, which is more ancient, that more ancient, which is even from the beginning, than from the beginning, which is from the apostles, it will in like manner surely be acknowledged that has been derived by tradition from the apostles, which has been preserved in violate in the churches of the apostles. Let us see what milk the Corinthians drank from Paul to what rule the Galatians were recalled by his reproofs. What is read by the Philippians, the Thessalonians, the Ephesians, Ephesians, what is the testimony of the Romans who are nearest to us, to whom Peter and Paul left the gospel and that sealed by their own blood? We have moreover churches founded by John, for even if Marcion rejects his apocalypse, still the succession of bishops, bishops in the seven churches, if traced to its source, will rest on the authority of John. And the noble descent of other churches is recognized in the same manner. I say then that among them, and not only among the apostle churches, but among all the churches which are united with them in Christian fellowship, the gospel of Luke, which was earnestly defended, has been maintained from its first publication. The same authority of the apostle churches will uphold the other gospels which we have in due succession through them, and according to their usage, I mean those of the apostles Matthew and John, although that which was published by Mark may also be maintained by Peter's, whose interpreter Mark was, for the narrative of Luke also is generally ascribed to Paul, since it is allowable that which scholars publish should be regarded as their master's work. End of quote. Great quote that. Absolutely great quote. Uh, before I, I go and finish the last paragraph, I just want to talk about about that. So we see two cultures here. We see Alexandria, which was immensely cultured at the time, uh, remembered as a great library of ancient literature. And we have a man in Clement who was a very cultured, learned man who sees the four Gospels as authoritative. And then we see in another culture in Africa, in Carthage, a another scholar of eminence who, who sees the four Gospels as authoritative. And this can be transcribed all around the ancient Roman world. This is a powerful argument and can't be overturned easily by any proto-orthodox theories that we see today by the Bart Ermans of this world and, and his school of thought. Because the whole, the, the, the four Gospels were seen unanimously around the Roman Empire as authoritative and were used in such a case, it kind of buries any conspiracy theories on its head. Tertullian's contention is reasonable, says Dale. The churches which apostles had founded preserved the writings of their apostle founders. The churches of Thessalonica, Corinth, Ephesus preserved Paul's epistles to the first generation of Christians in their cities. The, the epistle to the Galatians, full of sharp rebuke to the man who received the gospel of Paul with such enthusiasm that they should have plucked out their eyes for him, but who within a year or two were listening to another gospel which was not a gospel at all was preserved by the churches of Galatia. The Roman church preserved Paul's epistle to the Romans. The churches founded by John preserved the writings of John. All the four gospels, and especially the gospel of Luke, with which in his controversy with Marcion, Tertullian was more immediately concerned, had been handed down in the same way. The sacred books were in the keeping of organized societies whose members regarded them as authoritative records of divine revelation revelation what which was the law of their earthly conduct and the foundation of their immortal hopes it is irrelevant to any to say that tertullian though a man of powerful intellect had no faculty for literary criticism our contention is not that he was a great literary critic but that therefore we ought to accept his judgment on the authority of the genuous of the four gospels but that he is a witness to the great place in the thought and life of the church with the gospel, which the Gospels held before the close of the second century. For this fact, the evidence contained in these writings is decisive. Um, 
that's it really I, I so again we, we've stated that argument very clearly about the spread of the use of the gospels around the ancient world i've made that argument very clear in other uh talks and uh you know it, it, it it's an argument that can't be overturned and kind of demolishes the modern scholars such as bart herman and uh you know even in the time of dale uh he saw the value of that argument so we're going to look at eusebius uh now uh in the next video so we're going to do another video and we're going to do it on eusebius <laughs>